I'm Don Ellis, and I'm sitting here with George Harrison, who Hi, has Don. done something really extraordinary. And uh, I'd like to ask you, I've seen this tape of a concert you did with Robbie Shanker and friends in Albert Hall in London, and it's something that I've never heard, and I've been into Indian music for a good, good number of years, and uh, it's with all sorts of ensemble and, and, and things that I've never experienced in Indian music, and what, what's it all about? Yeah, well, apart from the people who are just into Ravi Shankar music or the various soloists from India, there's a lot of people who still think about it as, you know, just a sitar or just this, you know, just two people playing. Mm. There's never been an opportunity to see like an orchestra, which in Western music, you know, you can see soloists or you can see orchestras. I came across this piece of music Ravi had written long before I'd met him, that he performed once in Bombay, which was called Navarasaranga, which used vocalists, uh, violin players, flute players, a whole lot of percussion players. It was like um, an orchestra, a small orchestra. And since that time, I was trying to figure out a way of how to bring all these people to the West and for him to make special compositions in order to maybe open up the uh, concept the Western audiences have on Indian music. There are so many Indian musicians here. How did it happen that you got them all in one place at the same time? First of all, we brought them to England, uh, 16, 17 musicians, brought them to England. He composed the music um, mainly to each day in the evening before the rehearsal or on his way out. See, he works like very spontaneous. And so he, he'll have the people sitting down there have an idea and give each one their part and then count it off and everybody comes in. You think it's going to sound crazy, but it all fits. And if one person plays the wrong note out of 16 people, Ravi's got such an ear, he pick it up straight away. So most of this has been composed right on the spot, then arranged and rehearsed for a very short time. We didn't have too much time. And then they played the Albert Hall and a tour which went to Paris and Copenhagen and Germany, just around Europe. In this first piece, there's a rhythmical cycle of seven, three, two, two. And one of the things I find most exciting about it is to follow the pattern that you hear on the little finger symbols, long, short, short, and then relate what the, for example, the drummers are doing to that pattern. And when you do that, you hear all these cross rhythms and, and incredible things that they're, that they're doing, which, in my opinion, are far beyond the capabilities of the best Western drummer that I've ever heard. And uh, when you're aware of this going on, it just becomes an absolutely thrilling and incredible experience. You were one of the first people that I know of, especially in the pop field, to get into Indian music. How did this come about? I met Ravi. From that point on, it was mainly the involvement with him that drew me more and more into the music. Did you study with him? Well, sort of, yeah. I spent a lot of time, uh, whenever I could, just practicing. And the great thing for me was that in pop music, I never had any teacher. You know, I never learned piano, I never learned to read, I never learned how to play the guitar, actually. There was never anybody who's, you know, to play basic scales. So this was the first time I ever got involved with seriously trying to start at the first point, which was mm. just playing scales. And the whole thing gave me a bit of discipline, which I'd never had before. But it was mainly through him, you see, because during that period I'd been around and met all kinds of people, musicians and film stars and various heavyweight people, but I don't know, there was always something uh, that wasn't impressing me, you know? And he was so intriguing because he's such a little person and yet had so much strength and so much power that I was became so attracted to the music then through the person and uh, it was the deeper I got into it just the more there was you know well as we all know this was like probably at the same time at the when uh, the Beatles were at their peak of popularity Who? The, uh, <clears throat> how did your fellow uh, compatriots in that group feel about Indian music and your involvement in it uh, well, the very first time Ravi played 
at home. This was the first day I'd ever had a lesson from him. They were all invited over, and in the evening he played with Ala Varka and just played a little concert to us and a few friends. And uh, I think, I mean, they were amazed, and I'm sure they really got into it. I mean, Ringo in particular was just couldn't believe it. In fact, it had the opposite effect on Ringo, because for me, I was just so intrigued just to try and grasp a little bit of it, and mainly the sitar for me, the stringed instrument, it was so flexible, you know, when you get into blues and all those sort of styles. The sitar, just the way it's constructed, well, all their instruments, actually, the construction of them and the whole uh, ancientness of them, the instruments are being developed, so you can do certain things on them which you just can't do on Western instruments. And likewise with the drums, Ringo just sat there and watched Alaraka, <laughs> and then he ran a mile. <laughs> you know, he just didn't want to go near them, you know? Well, I mean, it has lots to be a mind-blowing experience. Because sure. if you see it this close, that's the funny thing with the sitar, if you watch a concert and you can hear the sitar or you hear a record, but if you sit up this close, it's just amazing because it's like an orchestra in itself or the sympathetic strings, you know? Yeah. You just hit one note and yet this whole orchestra comes out of there. And it actually just looks, I suppose with any uh, master of anything, is a uh, person who makes something look very simple. And a lot of the time, with Alan Varka playing, it just looks as though he's doing this, <laughs> and Ravi's just doing this. But what's coming out mm. is unbelievable. Leads us into this next piece yeah. very, very well, as a matter of fact, because this one I found to be probably one of the most extraordinary pieces I've ever heard. It's, it, to me, it's, there's a very definite uh, influence from the West in it. I hear counterpoint, I hear some harmonies, it combines the vocal thing yeah with uh, with the instrumental and the rhythmic and it's sort of all in one and it's light it's the happy. swing will sing it's, yeah it's it's everything yeah. and uh, it's one of the most enjoyable things i've yeah. ever heard thing the people got into in the 60s which became like an indian music fad sitar boom mm. but what happened well during that period uh, i never played western music either to listen to or to play never touched the guitar for three years you went totally apart into from it. yes just apart from when I go and play on a session just to make an album then I'd play but I was always playing the sitar and after hearing so many of these musicians in India I realized I was not going to get anywhere as a sitar player I was also forgetting everything about where I was coming from and it just, as naturally as I got into it, I got back out of it in as much as I decided I'm going to be a pop musician. That's really what I am. And uh, what happened also was that with the sitar boom, there was thousands of people coming to concerts because Ravi had been working for years trying to establish Indian music. There was a big boom and then it leveled back out again. And then it took him another two years in order to reestablish himself the good thing that came from that was that it did expose so many more people to the music and they were much more serious about it. By the time the boom had disappeared and the people who were left were actually real lovers of the music with a deeper understanding. Ravi made some statements uh, which were rather played up in the press at the time about he didn't want people to come to his concert getting spaced out on drugs. Mm. He, if they wanted to hear Indian music, he yeah. wanted them sober. And do you think that turned off a lot of? Because uh, at that time, a yeah. lot of people were into. Well, a lot of people, things. a lot of people get turned off by a lot of things. Mm -hmm. He always felt cheated by the audience, but um, also in where he's coming from. I mean, it's such a part. It's also part of the the spiritual life in India. The, the mm -hmm. classical music and all those ragas are going so deep that it's, and the training to be a musician is. Uh, it's a spiritual training, you know, you get up and very early in the morning, take your bath, do your yoga and say your prayers and then practice for three hours and then you have your, your coffee, you know. So it's like with such dedication that, you know, that's why he'd always um, expect people to have a little respect for it. I mean, I think that's the most difficult thing in the West because everybody's, you know, just wants to boogie and uh, it's hard for them to understand exactly where it's coming from but 
you know, one of the things that impressed me is just concerning the overall thing of the music was the very first lesson I had. We were playing, I was learning scales, and the telephone rang. I put the sitar down on the floor and stood up and went to go out to answer the phone, and I picked my foot up to step over, and he went bang. <laughs> so the first thing you learn is to have respect for the instrument. Mm. And it's, and that's fantastic, you know, it takes uh, respect in order to appreciate fully anything, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, in this piece that is the finale that we're, that we're about to hear, uh, it's based on a lot of folk rhythms. And, uh, and I think the inspiration came from, from folk yeah. things. Isn't this sort of common at the end of a concert to, to get yeah. very light and happy then again? This After all this yeah. deep, uh, intense, intense stuff, then yeah. just sort of let it flow. Oh, I think it's, I really congratulate you for well, doing something that is well, absolutely you. extraordinary and couldn't have taken place without you. Good, well, let's do it again sometime. <laughs> I'm ready. Thank <laughs> you and everybody for enjoying it.